Yes, they're mom jeans. <laughs> Wear them proudly. Um, I feel so naked up here without a podium or slides, but, um, and I'm senile, so I re require some notes. So I'm here tonight to talk to you about public health, and conveniently, uh, early next month is National Public Health Week, and so um, I want to talk to you about what it means to be in public health and what it means to be an individual in public health. Okay, and I draw my inspiration for my career um, from Curtis Mayfield, 1972. Some parents in the audience help me out here. The song, Keep On Keeping On. All right, so public health has been around for a long time, hundreds, hundreds, thousands of years. And some of the most recent and wonderful public health advan advances um, have been things like um, garbage collection, window screens, the cotton mill. Suddenly we have cotton underwear, stop signs, refrigeration, immunization, airbags in car. These are technological advances. Okay. Um, notice I have not said anything about medicine yet. Okay. These are all technological advances. Now, the, the um, result of these advances is that we've conquered most uh, communicable diseases that killed people off historically. The plague, um, uh, many forms of influenza, et cetera. The consequence is um, we talk about the public health transition. And so what our issues are now are lifestyle-related diseases being the leading causes of death in the United States. These lifestyle diseases, as you know, are diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. So I always feel like I have to differentiate what I do from medicine. Public health for years has been about prevention. Okay, and, and this is quite different than the curative aspects of medicine. In fact, in public health, we like to say that medicine is the failure of public health. If we have done our job and done it perfectly, there wouldn't be a need for medicine. And so you can appreciate now, you know, perhaps where funding should go more toward the preventive end rather than the more expensive curative end. More recently, public health has added health promotion to its mission. And contrary to what many people think, health promotion is not simply the flip side of disease prevention. Rather, it's a distinct construct, and it's central to what I'm talking about tonight, the new public health. In 1986, the World Health Organization, Ottawa Charter, defined health promotion as the process of enabling people to take control over the determinants of their own health. Now, this was a new concept because suddenly it put the individual, it made the individual the participant in their own health rather than simply a recipient. One becomes a player on their own behalf rather than a spectator. But what are the determinants of health within a society? Um, if you read my middle-aged ladies' magazines, you would think it's, oh, the number of gynecologists in a society, the number of hospitals, the number of fitness clubs. But in fact, that is not so. Whether it's a mega city or you know, a village in a developing country, by three things, the status of water, the status of women, and literacy. So based on those three criteria, how would you rate the health of, say, Ward 8 in Southeast District of Columbia? Sadly, over the last two decades, I mean, technology around the world has advanced tenfold. Yet much of the world 
is starving and doesn't have access to potable water. Women, when they're not being raped or mutilated or sold in the sex trade, are still treated as less than in the workforce, in the media, and still, in 2012, are threatened with the loss of their reproductive rights. What does that say about our society, based on those three criteria that I outlined for you? Health promotion in the new public health concerns itself with health disparities. And what that is is the resource gap between the haves and the have-nots. The 1%, the 99%. The white male tenured professors and everyone else here in this community. <laughs> Oops. Right? <laughs> Okay, and, and this resource gap is what translates into greater and greater frequencies of obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and cancer in the 99% versus the 1%. And so what comprises this resource gap between the haves and the have-nots? Well, those are the very determinants of health that I was talking about. Number one, money also known as employment. Number two, education. Number three, political capital. Does everyone have the right to vote in this community? And if so, are they registered to vote? And can they get to polls? And finally, we talk about social capital. Does an individual have the ability to connect with their community in order to affect change on their own behalf? These are the four pillars of health promotion in the new public health. Notice I've said nothing about medicine, hospitals, or fitness arenas. But health disparities continue to get wider and wider in the United States, and this is especially so in Washington, D.C., the supposed uh, seat of world domination. And this makes me think that the world is not going to change anytime soon, at least not from the top down. And that brings me to you, okay, and this whole paradigm shift. Let's say that we can change the world from the bottom up and that public health starts within each one of us rather than from some clinic downtown that we get free condoms from. Okay, let's say it starts from within. And it's about you. Public health starts with you. It's about your connection with your family, with your roommate, with your partner, with your teammates. And from there, it moves outward toward the community and then to the world beyond. The new public health asks the question, am I willing to go with less in order to help the greater good? Ooh, that sounds like socialism. OK, well, so you know, when did that become a dirty word? Why is that wrong? Why is that bad? The new public health is about power sharing. You know, note to self, people, the poor and disenfranchised people are sick and tired of affluent white people telling them what's good for them. Okay, do you think the families in Ward 8 don't know that fruit and vegetables are good for them? You think it's like, oh, they don't know, and it's up to us to teach them. No. How about sharing power and jointly coming together to foster projects like food sustainability projects with the community? Make it theirs to own. Public health is about being a good citizen. And I mean that in the simple Native American tradition of leaving a place better than the way you found it. But the new public health takes courage, it takes integrity, and it takes stamina. Because you have to be the voice for people who don't have a voice. 
And that's often very hard to do. In um, field hockey and lacrosse, we talk about the concept of soft hands, hard shot. Right? When you're receiving a ball, you loosen your grip, right? So the ball stays. But boy, when you're going to take a shot, it's, you know, balls to the wall. Take the shot and make it good. If you can't swear, you, can't, you, you don't belong <laughs> in public health. I'm, it's ugly and dirty. So courage and te integrity, you know, they're necessary. And, and it's, you know, it's, it's all very easy to be courageous, right, when the waters are calm. The real test of these attributes is when your ass is on the line, right? Or how about when a gun's pointed at you? Imagine that Arab Spring last year. Many of us have a hard time with this type of work, the work involved in social reform, because we spend so much energy on not feeling good enough. You know, we carry that monkey on our back, always there, that tells us, you know, we're ugly or too fat, right? We're stupid, or worse, we're afraid. Okay, at age 55, I'm happy to say, yes, that monkey is still there, but I finally mastered the art of turning to it when it starts sending those messages to me, and I just say, fuck off. <laughs> and it works. Took me a long time to figure that out. Just turn and tell it to go away. Don't feed it, don't indulge it, because that to me is what sin is. When you don't act because you're afraid or that what you have to say doesn't matter, that's a sin. Sometimes I think we, as a society, are too lazy or perhaps confused to worry about others. All right, What does it say about a society who would rather um, stand in line to wait to go up the escalator when there's a set of stairs right next to it? What does that say? Better yet, what about a society that sells Krispy Kreme donuts? in order to raise money for Habitat for Humanity. Do you not see the irony in that? <laughs> I mean, why not sell cigarettes? <laughs> OK. Oh, here, please buy these tokens of death so that we can go help other people. Sell cigarettes, you would make more money. In any case, the new public health is characterized by elegance, by simple maneuvers that have a big impact. And with regard to helping people gain control over the determinants of their health, examples of elegance are things like voter registration campaigns, um, English as a second language, or adult education programs, urban community gardens, teaching someone to knit. OK, imagine that. Look what you can do just by learning two stitches, knit and purl. Yeah, 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 you can make a sweater, but you can also turn that into a business. And suddenly, now you have a little industry, and more importantly, your own income. So again, public health starts with you. Work towards peace and equity with every decision that you make every single day. Stop selling Krispy Kreme donuts, especially not out in front of the School of Public Health. <laughs> <laughs> no matter where you live, have a garden. Even if that garden are in you know, the, the buckets, have a garden and tend to that garden. Simple actions repeated every day that has a huge impact. And share the harvest with people. Do me a favor, go on YouTube. Do, you know, the thing, Curtis Mayfield, 1972. Download the lyrics to it. Public health starts with you. From now on, whenever you have a choice, take the stairs. Thank you.